So we'll start right off. Um, kind of the garbage man. I used to be at the very end to wrap stuff up, but you'll see as we go along, hopefully some of this will make sense. Up until a couple of years ago, I ran the field trip, and now Rich Suggs has taken over. I'm appreciative of that, but so I'm not always sure. I gave him the guide book. I don't know everything that he covered, and so just to kind of reinforce some of the things. Those of you that uh, have I ended up putting a lot of coal and stuff into this one, and then uh, when I do the Lignite Energy Council one, which I, again, I haven't done that one for a couple of years, I always throw some petroleum in there, so it's kind of, I'm kind of the odd man out on this. What I wanted to show, because I know it didn't come out very well in your field trip guide, these are, as you went up Highway 83 by Wilton, uh, these are underground mine collapse features, and, and uh, so I think they're much easier for you to see here. and. Um, yeah, this is a real problem in North Dakota. The Public Service Commission has gone back in and, and they filled these in. So this particular site was mined in the uh, early 1900s, nine, 10 feet of coal at a depth of 50 to 60 feet. And so what happens then is unfortunately with the soft rock above that, it starts collapsing in on itself. So these are all mine, uh, these are rooms. You can literally follow those straight across and, and uh, also, I'll, I'll talk just a little bit. I've got a, you can see a huge area up here too. And uh, so there's been instances like just north of Beulah is another site that goes across the highway. Uh, north uh, between uh, Minot, Fox Home, up through that area. Again, they've had to go in and try to stabilize the road because they've had collapse uh, where these mines extend under the road. And the big problem is there are some, some maps. And as I said, the Public Service Commission is in charge of this, not the geological survey. And they have some mine maps, but uh, a lot of areas they don't, and, the, and they're not all that accurate. But we had a geologist working for us in the, in the 1920s who was complaining already. These mines were already collapsing at that point. And he pointed out that uh, for safety, they would leave coal, what they call pillars, to help support the roof. And on the way out of an area, as, as they backed out of an area of an underground mine, they would rob those. They would mine all the coal out of that. And that he was arguing they had to stop doing that. Uh, but it was a common practice up until underground mining ceased, which it ceased in the 60s, I think the last one in Williams County, but most of it was, was uh, ended by the, the late 1940s. Just a quick thing, talking, you know, since I'm talking to a group of teachers, here is a surface mine operation, and those are what we call spoil piles. Again, if you, you, you took the Lignite Energy Council teacher conference, you went on a field trip, you would have gone by and seen some, some old spoils, and then they point out, you know, they're doing a, a good job. They can't do that anymore. So they mine that, they throw it in these basically almost windrows, and then they would get to the coal, and then they would just leave. 1975, I was a senior at Bismarck High, in a class called Present Day Living. I don't know if they even do something like that anymore, but we got a film that Montana Dakota U Utility put out. And as a senior, I'm sitting there thinking, this is 100% propaganda. And, and it was, they were arguing that uh, the state was, was setting up rules to go back in and no longer be able to leave these spoil piles. And that actual rule, I think, was passed in, in 1977. But they went into the Custer mine. Anybody familiar with that by Garrison? You know, that one is, is really unique because the Boy Scouts got into that in the, in the 50s and when some other service groups planted trees. That one is really a nice area. Uh, Noonan, if anyone's up from that uh, divide, Burke County area, uh, that's more like you're walking on the moon. I mean, there's very little vegetation in a large part of those mines. But anyway, so I, I sat and watched that, and they've got had a bulldozer up in the Custer mine knocking all these beautiful trees down, saying this is what the state's going to make us do. And uh, seven years later, I'm working on a project for the, with the Geological Survey and the Public Service Commission to determine whether or not we had, these companies should come back in and, and reclaim all these, these old uh, surface mines. And so I always thought, I thought, well, it's interesting. As a senior, I sat and watched that, and then seven years later, I'm involved in that project. And what we determined was that if you leveled out those spoils, you would actually impact the groundwater much more than, than it's being right now. But the, but the big problem was they didn't save the soil. So you could flatten those out, but you'd have no soil 
to, to put over it. Okay, this is just a close-up, again, of, of what we were just looking at with these mines. But also notice you get these round circles. These are all depressions that are starting. So again, at a depth of 50 or 60 feet, these mine uh, voids, these mine rooms are collapsing and they're starting to show small depressions. So it's holding a little bit more water and that's why the vegetation is, is much greener. And then eventually a lot of these get filled with water. But we've had you know, houses that have been built, unfortunately, over this, as I mentioned before, highways. People have had outbuildings and tractors have dropped into these and things like that. So they, they can be very dangerous. This is uh, down in Hedinger County near Haynes. This is what they look like at the surface. And again, here's one maybe it makes it easier to understand. So that's where eventually, that, this probably 10 years from now, this will look like the previous picture, is that the, the roof keeps caving down on itself. I walked down in here, you know, and, and of course, again, as I say, you're walking on what had been the ceiling probably a couple years earlier. Plus, there was a skunk in there that I could smell, so I didn't go in there very far. Okay, and then uh, you went up Highway 83 and turned on the 23 towards Newtown. And you hopefully noticed, and I think Rich, if he had time, depends on when they, they start running the films. He's not always able to, to point things out. But uh, these are, you should have seen a, a series of very small lakes that we call potholes or kettles. So what happens, this is an glaciated terrain. So in the glaciation, the ice is stagnant, it begins melting, it gets covered with material, and then when that, when that ice melts, of course, it leaves this void space, and then that fills up. So that's how those potholes are formed. Again, just examples, just pointing to, to, to a few examples. Quite different, uh, I didn't notice if anyone was from uh, south, far southwestern North Dakota, but down in Slope County, here's an area that uh, we have no evidence was ever glaciated. We know three-fourths of North Dakota was glaciated, but the southwestern corner, we don't have any evidence. Probably was, but probably so long ago that uh, that evidence is gone. But what we've got is what we call integrated drainage. This is Bacon Creek, and you can follow that all the way along, and it's got all these tributaries. So again, we call that integrated drainage. That's an old, uh, that's an evidence, that's an old uh, surface. Certainly, uh, the surface itself is probably uh, a couple tens of millions of years old. Quite different, again, than, than a glaciated surface that, that uh, could be as young as 12,000. This is up in Montreal County near um, uh, Blaisdell, and uh, what, what I want to point out here is there's a raised plateau right through here along with the what we call hummocky topography. This is how that formed. Again, it, it's an example of geology we call inverted topography. This was a low area when that lake was, was uh, and the sediments were being formed, those lake sediments, and then as the ice adjacent to it melted, then that became a high area. This is, uh, I don't know, again, if Rich pointed out that uh, there's a couple small outcrops just north of Bismarck along Highway 83 of the Cannonball Formation. That's a marine unit. I think John's probably going to touch on that in, in his discussions. But um, this is along the Hart River in Morton County. Just uh, look a little bit better look at those rocks uh, here, pretty good sandstone. But, um, and John's probably going to, he may use this very same picture, but if, if you were uh, standing here in Bismarck 67, 68 million years ago, this is what you would have seen uh, looking out the, to the interior seaway that came up from Texas. And uh, this was when we had depositions of Fox Hills and Pier. And again, John will talk about that. Then, then that receded, the dinosaurs died out, and then this Cannonball Seaway came back. And that's the last vestige of, of the sea in North Dakota. But we had sharks, and John's done a lot of studies on, on, star, on sharks in both those units, both the Fox Hills and in the uh, Cannonball. Cannonball mudstone, uh, those, those of you from, from Bismarck, uh, your, your basement in, in uh, all likelihood is, was dug into this. You've got these sand couplets running through uh, primarily of a, a shale or a clay mudstone. And uh, what we think is you had, the, you had the ocean or the sea, then you had the beach, and then behind it you had like a estuary or tidal mudflats. And then during storm systems, high water, 
those sands would be transported in and deposited. Uh, and John has found uh, uh, crabs and, and uh, other things that, again, he'll probably touch on in, in that. Here's a typical basement foundation in Bismarck. So one of the problems that we run into here, it's the same thing if you're in the Red River Valley, but, but, it, but those are entirely different rocks. But uh, one of the problems is that you can have a swelling clays in here. And all, almost all the, the clays in North Dakota have a swelling clay component. So what you want to do, whether you're in the Red River Valley, uh, Don Schwartz at NDSU has really preached this, or you're here in Bismarck or up in, up in Minot and other areas, is get the water away from your foundation. You know, you see people that their downspouts just go right there, or uh, some people who don't even have gutters and downspouts, so that water comes off the roof and then goes right down along the foundation and gets into these swelling clays. And so there's a number of people in Bismarck that have had foundation problems uh, due to this. Okay, so you, you um, would have turned up, gone towards uh, Newtown. I don't know if you saw it on the bus, but then you turned north. This is um, a present day uh, photograph showing, here's Newtown, this is Lake Sakakawea. What I want to point out is notice the width of, this had been prior to the dam, so prior to before it, it filled up in 54. This is the width of the Missouri River Valley here. See how it, relatively same width over here, but a very narrow channel here. And that's uh, because 50 to, to 14,000 years ago, Missouri River flowed right through Newtown, where Newtown is today. And then we know that 14,000 years ago, a glacial lobe expanded over, blocked the Missouri River. And what happened is the water backed up all the way to at least Williston because we found these lake sediments up at certain elevations from that glacial lake. Then it had enough power behind it that it burst through that ice dam that the glacier had created and then migrated along the edge of that lobe creating this new channel. And that's why that channel is so much narrower. So this is the, the present day, what it looks like presently. And what's interesting about that, and I know this, I gotta get a better picture of this, but here's what we were just looking at, this lobe. These are landslides in red. So you can see there's a lot of landslides along here. There's also, here's a little Missouri flowing up. Uh, and there's, there's some landslides across there, but then you see where it turns at the north unit of the park and flows over the Missouri, it's solid landslides. And that's because six, prior to 600,000 years ago, the, the, and I know there's a couple people from Watford, at least a couple teachers, but, um, the Little Missouri used to flow right up through Watford City, up through Tobacco Garden Creek, and then it got, when the glacier came down, it blocked it, and again forced it to go east, and it cut a very deep, narrow channel. And that narrow, steep channel then was very susceptible to landslides. If uh, you've driven Highway 85, anywhere uh, near the north unit of the park, uh, there's that, Highway is always undergoing construction because of landslides. So by the time you, when you start down into the Little Missouri Valley there and come back up, virtually all that rock has been has been slumped or, or moved. And this is again commonplace uh, for a slump, rotational slump here. John and I did a book on Lewis and Clark back in 2003. Us, us and about everybody else, but but uh, we did one on the geology when. Lewis and Clark came through here. Uh, there's a, like four or five places in North Dakota where we were able to take their journals and walk that back and determine exactly where they had walked on a given day. Uh, all the rest of the time, you couldn't. But on May, or I'm sorry, on April 14th, Clark walked along this North Shore here, and then Lewis walked along the, the South Shore. And what's interesting in his journal, I don't have it here, the quotes, but he talked about how broken the landscape was. Well, he walked entirely on landslides through that, through that area. Then the next day, uh, Clark walked up through this valley, because they were in an area now, they weren't sure what tribes they were gonna run into and if they'd be friendly. So he walked up through this valley to, to kind of stay hidden, got up and walked up on this high point, and this is exactly where he stood. And uh, John and I were the first to, to make that discovery. Looking to the northeast, here's Newtown in the distance. And he wrote this, talked about how beautiful the area was. But most importantly to us is he talked about how the drainages 
and this is his, his spelling, not mine, but uh, he talked about how the drainages were coming in from the northeast. And he could see over and hear some of the, the uh, uh, creeks and rivers coming in. And this follows, the, the, these uh, waterways are following the natural joining systems that, that uh, actually go all the way down the fracture system down into the Bakken. And so, and, and Rich might have talk, uh, touched on this, when you, when you put the laterals for this area, the Sandish and the partial fields, the first fields that were discovered, <coughs> excuse me, you see that they ran their laterals, since they knew that the most fractures and joints were running uh, from the northeast, southwest, then they ran their laterals northwest, southeast to intercept those and, uh, and, and produce more, more oil. I'll show you a uh, map a little bit later showing that's still some of the best wells we've got in North Dakota. Okay, again, as I say, I'm just throwing all these different things in here. You got close to the area where we've got Playa Lakes up in northwestern North Dakota. Anyone tell me what this is? Ice, right? It's actually salt. But, uh, and this is all salt. This is up in, this is uh, up near El Cabo in Divide County. These are Playa Lakes. Many of them go totally dry in the fall. And as the water cools, it's, it's, it's holding a lot of sodium sulfite, not table salt, which is sodium chloride, but sodium sulfite. And uh, you, you know that uh, if you talk to those farmers up there as alkali, sometimes you'll see this out in the field where the field's just white. And again, that's sodium sulfate. So, uh, and again, as I said, that when the water cools, it's no longer, and I think, and I know we've got a couple of chemistry teachers in there, but it's no longer able to, to hold uh, those salts in solution. And, and as I said, then some of these become uh, totally dry. Now, there has been instances of people walking out on these. I tried a number of years ago. Unfortunately, in, in some of these lakes are 80 feet deep as far as the mud in there. The mud is the consistency of, of and it's very black, organic rich, contains a lot of hydrogen sulfide, but a lot of uh, also methane. But uh, it's the consistency between pudding and peanut butter. And so if you break through that top, top crust, you gotta hope there's another salt layer in there somewhere you can sink right down. We did drilling on these lakes. I don't have a picture of it. But uh, the whole time we, we uh, and I'm kind of getting off on this, but we read a paper that had been written in the 1940s for Northeast Montana where the engineers calculated that the uh, in areas where we still had ice because the, the salt content was so high on these lakes that it, the salt or the ice was only stable at minus 20. So we went out there and drilled in February at the coldest temperatures just to make sure. But as we drove around these lakes, we had all the windows open because if you, if you broke through that ice and got into this mud, you pretty much had one chance to get out through the window. And uh, so it was a pretty, pretty miserable project. Um, I want to show again, again, this is all salt. You can see here that there's some red tinge to this. These lakes are full of brine shrimp. And uh, up in Canada, they actually harvest these and then dry them and then use them as uh, fish uh, uh, food. And unfortunately, you know, again, as I say, the, uh, with the salt uh, precipitating in the, in the uh, late fall, uh, you can get waterfowl caught in that. You know, if they land on this lake, temperatures drop, the lake is a little bit cooler, they can actually get encrusted with salt. And this is a Ross Goose, that, uh, that's what's happened to it. And unfortunately, it was pecking. I, I actually picked it up, brought it back to Bismarck, gave it to a friend who was on a farm, and he tried to nurse it back to health. Found out later I violated several uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife things, but I thought we'll try to save this. But it, it died because it had ingested so much salt because it was trying to peck the salt off of its, of its wings. Okay, so now we're into the Wilson Basin. And Rich had, uh, I gave him a copy of my presentation a couple years ago, so I don't know how much he's incorporated. So just, just yell at me if this is all uh, a repeat. But here's the outline, and the dashed outline of the Wilson Basin. So you can see ex the extent of the Bakken goes up into Alberta, then the name changes, and then beneath that, the three forks in blue. And uh, this is, I, I put this together a number of years ago to give people an, a, a sense of, 
of the thickness of the rocks we're dealing with of the Bakken system. Mistake capital, 241 feet high. So the Bakken fits in there pretty well. In fact, it used to, uh, three or four years ago, fit in there perfectly, but we keep extending the, the Bakken petroleum system, we keep extending it down through the three forks. So it originally was defined as the basal 50 feet of the lodgepole formation, all of the Bach, and then the top 50 feet of the, of the three forks. But now we keep pushing down as wells go deeper and deeper into the three forks. But you can see the Bach in itself would come in between the ninth and 15th floor of the, of the state capitol. The 13th floor is about the middle of, of where the uh, middle Bakken sits, and that used to be the, the main target as, as this play first, start, uh, excuse me, first started. So if here's a, uh, I took this off of Google Earth, so we're 10,000 feet above Bismarck in, in this, uh, as far as the, the altitude here. And so this is pretty much the scale, so you come down, do the kickoff, and then run out two miles, staying right in the, on that uh, 13th floor of the state capitol, so you can see how amazing uh, the technology is to be able to do that. And of course that's, and again, maybe Rich talked about that or, or somebody else, but when you look at the lateral, it's actually pretty much going up and down. I mean, they're trying to stay in there, but it's very difficult. One of the things that I sit on the Oil and Gas Research Council, we give out money to academia and to companies to try to find new ways of, of developing things better. And uh, some of the money was given to UND along with the U.S. Navy to take the gyros off of ICBM missiles and then put those on a drill bit so they could have better control. And one of the interesting things is, is the conditions on that drill bit are worse than these missiles going in and out of the atmosphere. So they're, they're, they're still working on that. I'm going to have to grab a drink. Well, any, any questions to this point at all? Is a lot of this so far, as far as this part, uh, on the Bakken been a repeat or? Okay, thank you. Okay, this is, I, I like to show this to people. Um, if we had a mythical uh, backhoe that could go down 16,000 feet right along uh, the uh, I-94, this is what it would look like, the Williston Basin. And uh, what you've got, the, the colored layers are sedimentary rocks and then the, the gray or the igneous and metamorphic, we also call, refer to this as a basement rock. So if you're in Fargo, to get down to this, the igneous metamorphic basement rocks, you've only got to go down in some areas 250 feet. You get to Watford City, drill down to get to those same granites and, and, and metamorphic rocks, you've got to go 16,000 feet. So that's the Williston Basin. That, that's, and and uh, so, just trying to show that. So we're going to go very quickly through the development of the Williston Basin, how it, how it started. We go back a couple billion years. We had essentially two uh, continents, the one we called the Superior Province, the other the Wyoming Province. And then between them was like an island arc. And then these things came together. As we know, the continents today move around. So they were also doing that back then. And so as they did, they squeezed the rocks up and to the point where uh, we speculate that, that we would have had Andes here, mountain range uh, uh, rivaling the Andes in, in North Dakota uh, a couple billion years ago. And then over time, then that all eroded down. And uh, so we get to about a half billion years ago. And then we, we 540 million years ago, the Deadwood Formation uh, began to be deposited. And uh, as we go through, I'm missing a slide here, but the, the deadwood also sat there and, the, the, and uh, the rocks probably moved up a little bit. So we got eroded, created what we call an unconformity. And that's that jagged uh, pattern that we have on here. And I'll, I've got some better examples of that. But as we get into Ordovician 460 million years ago, we get a sag now. And people still are arguing why the, the crust in this area started to, to move down. And I think it may have been a reaction to other things going on, the, the uh, Black Hills and some other things. So anyway, stresses came into the area and, and it caused the, the surface to down warp there. And at some point then, as you start putting sediments into that, the sediments themselves, the weight of that, start adding to the acceleration of, 
of the formation of the basin. So when we see blue at the top, this, the blue, this blue color, that represents uh, marine or, or ocean settings. So we go through the Red River, Inner Lake. I'm just going to throw these out. Because the more important thing is, as you see how the basin then is settling down and uh, complete with sediments. Here's the Inner Lake where we've got an unconformity developed on that. Asher and Winnipegosis. And here we are at the Bakken. We'll come back to that. You'll see that several times. So this is what, if you looked at a map view, back during Bakken development 360 million years ago, the land is shown in this green and brown, and then water is uh, shades of blue. And the, the darker the blue, the deeper the water. So you see very shallow waters through much of, of uh, southern Canada and, and uh, central US. Here's North Dakota outline. But then you do see uh, deeper water through here extending up and so here is the Wilston Basin right here. And so we look at names. Remember I mentioned the Bakken, uh, this is we call the, this is known as the Elkhorn Basin running through here, but you've got the Bakken being developed uh, and, and deposited in the Exshaw. Some of these other names, Woodford, Antrim, New Albany, Chatt Chattanooga, you might have heard of before. So at this time in, in, in geology, we had a lot of very organic rich shales being deposited. Most of these are, are really tremendous gas plays right now. The, the Bakken is unique in that it's more of an oil play. John may touch on this, the, the Devonian, when these rocks are being deposited, the rise of the fishes, the age of fishes, and we had some very interesting fishes here, these, these armor-plated fishes. We also had the, the uh, rise of the shark, which, which again, to uh, paleontologists, biologists, is very interesting. Uh, of how they really have have evolved very little over over time. They they got things right very early on and haven't had it to adapt very much. Although you've got a lot of different types of sharks, the hammerheads and things like that. But the Devonian was also the, the rise of forests uh, for the first time. But not like we know them today, just full of where the high density of trees. These were still pretty spread out. But then you also got soil development, and there's some speculation that then uh, the uh, rivers and things bringing the, the uh, soil material down into the oceans, that may have been one of the sources of this high organic carbon that we find in, in, the, uh, in the Bakken shales. Another, another example of that. So again, we'll, we go back to the, the, the cross section of the basin, Mission Canyon, which is very important because still to this day, we've produced more oil out of the Mission Canyon than we have out of the Bakken. That's gonna change very quickly, probably uh, later this year. The Bakken will overtake it. Then we, again, we had the Big Snowy Group and we had another unconformity up through the Spearfish. And uh, again, an unconformity developed up the Indian Cara. Let's, let me just back up there for a second. The Indian Cara is very important. Uh, most people refer to it as the Dakota, which is, Dakota is the group the Indian carries a spe specific formation. That's where almost all the saltwater disposal goes on in, in North Dakota. And then we're up into the, to the Pier Shale, and then the Fort Union group, which is the coal-bearing rocks. This is Fort Union deposit after the dinosaurs died out. And then again, that we saw uh, major erosion into the, up into the White River Arikara. Those are only preserved on the major buttes in Western North Dakota now. We're at three million. Then we go through erosion and then uh, start in 1.6 million years ago. Then here come the glaciers. And uh, again, I'll just very quickly go through that. We had glaciers, at least a dozen or, or more, maybe possibly two dozen advances of the glaciers across North Dakota during that time period, leaving uh, glacial deposits behind, then over the last 10,000 years, we, we've gone through erosion to get us to the present day uh, landscape. So that's very quickly a running through how the Wilson Basin developed. And, they, and again, here's some of the names of, of the units, and uh, down here in, in white, the Bakken and Three Forks. Okay, very quickly, and I think Rich probably did touch on this because it's very important, the hydraulic fracturing in North Dakota. Here we've got the base of the fresh waters, the Fox Hills. Although if you're from Devil's Lake area, some people use, have, actually have their freshwater wells in the pier. 
it's, it's not very good water. So here we are down at 10,000 feet uh, fracking and hydraulic uh, fracturing in the Bakken Three Forks. So we've got 8,000 feet of, of uh, rock between that and the Fox Hills. So we've got a pretty good buffer there. And we're also three to 6,000 feet above the Precambrian basement, which, which again is important. That, that range uh, comes in depending on where you are in the basin. Then we look at the saltwater injection. Again, I mentioned the Indian Cara. We've got uh, 3,500 feet of shale between the Indian Cara and the Fox Hills. So again, that's a buffer to keep that saltwater from getting up into the freshwater. And, uh, and again, just as important, we've got 7,000 feet down the Precambrian. And I mentioned that because you've all probably heard reports or read reports uh, in the east, in Ohio, New York, some of these areas where they uh, relate fracking back to uh, uh, induced seismicity or creating earthquakes. And what they're talking about is where they take frac fluids, the flow back, and then put them down in an injection well, and that creates a problem. So it's, it's never directly related to fracking. It's, it's the frac fluids going back into an injection well. But in some cases, these injection wells are, are too close to the, to the Precambrian basement, and that's where you can get induced uh, uh, earthquakes. And there's a famous one in Ohio where the well was actually screened right into the Precambrian rocks. So, so we're, we don't have that situation here in North Dakota. Just to, again, those same units, just to point out that throughout uh, geologic time in North Dakota, and people always find this interesting, and John will reemphasize this, that uh, for the most part, uh, we've been in a marine setting. So you needed to have a boat if you were gonna be in North Dakota throughout most of geologic time. And it's only been the last uh, 65 million years that it's been predominantly non-marine. In fact, in the last 62, 60, to 62 million years, it's all been non-marine. And again, just some of those names. Oil window, I don't know if Rich or somebody touched on that, but you've actually got, and we can do this in general, running the calculations. We've got these organics, the carrigens, he probably talked about that, the organic parts that, if you literally cook them, they get hot enough, they'll produce oil. And if you get them too hot and get below the oil window, then uh, you're only gonna get gas because you've cooked off the, the uh, hydrocarbons that produce petroleum. And, and we've done calculations based on that. We've also calculated then that the Bakken began generating oil back 70 million years ago, which would have been again when the uh, dinosaurs were here. But this all relates back to this map. I'm curious how many of you have seen this map before. I, I assume you saw this map this week, but how many had seen the uh, the, uh, this map before that time. Most of the, I can guarantee most of the landowners in Mercer County and some of these areas along the edge of this have. So when I was just talking about the oil window, that's what we call the mature area. So everything, this light green is Bakken, this brown is Bakken. The difference is this part, you're in the deeper part of the basin, this is where the Bakken was buried deep enough that it got hot enough to generate oil. And, and we'll see in just a second why everyone is drilling wells here. So in order to, to find oil in the Bakken outside of that area, it had to move there, which is certainly possible, and, and there's some documented cases, but is much less uh, of a chance of finding oil there consistently than within the mature area. Okay, this is, I just wanted to show this is a little bit different presentation of, of exactly what we were just looking at. So here's all the uh, laterals, uh, and again, Rich explained that, uh, and again, Rich explained that the, these Bach and Three Forks wells go down two miles, then out laterally, horizontally two miles. And this is, uh, uh, which is difficult to see, I'm gonna blow this up in a second. But again, the dark gray is the mature area. So notice all these wells, they're color-coded to production, the, the white and yellow are the highest production for the first 60 days. But, but notice you get outside that area, very few wells, and in fact, along the east flank, which landmen uh, used to call the line of death, uh, you get beyond that, there's only one well producing, uh, the Traxel well in, in Mercer County. 
So we'll blow this up a little bit better. Here's Stanley, Williston, Watford City to get oriented. In fact, we see that there's, there's about a township. This is, again, based on our calculations, which aren't exact, but wells are about a township uh, west of where we thought there may still be production from this mature area. The, uh, this is what I mentioned before about this is a partial Sanish field. These actually were, they first started going down two miles and then out one mile initially in this play. And what's interesting about that is even though these are shorter laterals, these are still some of the best wells uh, for the initial production. Again, it's hard to see, but you can see all these different uh, um, traces of the wells. What happened is the state stepped in because even from the partial field over here to the Sandish field, companies started changing the orientation of their laterals and uh, the state ended up with, with stranded acreage and Bruce Hicks or somebody maybe talked about that. So the state stepped in and said, from here on, everyone's gonna run their laterals. They call them stand-ups, 1280s. They've gotta run north-south because otherwise, as people were, ch as companies were changing that orientation, you ran the risk of a, of a mineral owner not being able to get his acreage uh, uh, produced. These are uh, the main areas of Tyler, which maybe you've heard a little bit about that. We've been doing qu quite a bit of work on that. Tyler, Bakken, and then we get down into the Winnipeg. These are the, probably the three main sources for all the oil. We produce oil from 18 different horizons in the Wilson Basin, but the vast majority of that oil probably came from these three uh, formations. Okay, we're, we're gonna switch now and talk about uh, asteroids and, and meteorites. Any, anyone that teaches grade school probably wants a copy of this for their, at least the boys would, would enjoy this. So this is the, uh, the uh, Chicxulub asteroid that uh, uh, many scientists believe was the extermination of the dinosaur. It's been dated 65 million years ago. When, when as, asteroids hit the Earth, they've got so much power that, that it actually shocks, it, 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 it uh, creates a certain pattern within quartz grains, it's, which is called shock quartz. You only get that also with, with atomic blasts and things. So we, um, people went all over the Earth looking for examples of shock quartz that would have been transported in the atmosphere. And one of the places we found those was in, in southwest North Dakota, uh, south of Rame. So this guy's finishing his, his last meal there. Uh, put together an art, uh, little publication on, on meteorites in North Dakota. Nels Forsman is a professor from uh, UND and I. And Nels is really the space guy. He went down to Houston. His master's was, in, uh, was on Mars, uh, on the sedimentation on Mars. So uh, he's really kind of the brains behind that. Um, but I'm still, and part of this is a, from a presentation he gave yeah, talking about that this, the, these stones, the, the meteorites or asteroids, remnants of planetesimals, and I was reading that if you took all of the, the uh, asteroids, and those are the asteroid belts between Mars and Jupiter, if you took all of them together and, and, and put them together, it would be less than, than the size of the moon. But this material is spread out uh, throughout that area. Okay, I'm gonna I'm on the edge of my technological uh, knowledge, but I'm hoping that this works. This is uh, from 1992 in the fall. This is a meteor that was witnessed at, uh, coming across at a football game, so everyone just turned their camera up. And uh, what I want to talk about is it breaks up, and then you can see, into, which is very typical of these, into, into pieces with the larger pieces with the more inertia traveling further. And this, this one, the Peekskill uh, meteorite, is very famous for this reason. This is gonna pop up and pop right off, but I've, I've got another picture of that. Very famous because it hit an automobile. And this guy, uh, I'm sure when he first happened was none too happy, but these other pictures of him, you'll see he's always smiling. This, uh, this is his vehicle that toured the world. This is down in Japan. This is the actual me meteorite here got a little bit of, of paint from his car. Here he is again smiling because that meteorite worth uh, 
two and a half million dollars. <laughs> and so, uh, and that's cut up into very thin slices. So uh, what I f you find is that what you want is a meteorite that hit somebody, not yourself, but somebody else. And uh, here's an example, they're called hammers. I like to read this because meteorites for sale that, <coughs> excuse me, bash cars, crunch mailboxes, smashed houses, killed animals, mauled humans. There is one where a woman was in her house and it came through the, the uh, roof and landed on her bed, but uh, she didn't get hit from it. Would have been worth more money. This is one that killed a horse in uh, 1860, and you can see that just little two inch pieces of it are selling for uh, $400. So that's why we, we get a lot of meteorites. People bring in a lot of what they're hoping are meteorites to us, and I'll show some examples of what things that aren't meteorites. Okay, so with the peak skill, you can see in the film that it began breaking apart, and that's very typical of these meteorites. Uh, they also, they're, they're kind of vaporizing as they come through, and so 90 to 95, 95 to 99% of it gets, gets lost. Coming in at 240 miles an hour, and the larger ones uh, never really slow down and, and uh, are traveling at seven to 44 miles uh, per second, and that would have included then the Chicxulub. So what do we look for um, in a meteorite? And again, especially for the science teachers, high school, you, maybe you've had people bring your rocks, but cracks, a smooth surface, evidence of heating. This is a meteorite picked up in northeastern North Dakota called the Drayton meteorite. Notice the smooth surface. Again, the smooth surface of the Peekskill meteorite. And let me just back up, I'll come back to this for a second. Notice. This is kind of a, a brown, this is black, and we'll come back to that. So one of, the, one of the real characteristics of these, they're smooth, but they're also dimpled. And I always tell people, it's like taking your thumb and pushing it into Play-Doh. And those dimples are called regmalis, and that's where, as it's coming in, it's, it's vaporizing off. So that's very characteristic of these meteorites. Also, you can see cracks in there, but I, I've seen, certainly seen meteorites without that. You can, with a stony meteorite, you can uh, usually orient it to the, to the uh, light and you'll see the metal flex in there, the iron. A little closer example. So one of, the, one of the real misconceptions is that, and I think hopefully you'll kind of notice this as we go through, is that meteorites aren't that unusual, I mean, as far as, as uh, from other rocks. And that's why we get people bringing in Everything they bring in usually is very unusual because that, that just kind of makes sense that, that uh, well, it's from outer space, so it, it should look quite different. So here's uh, the, the two that I sh we have on our cover. This, again, is a Drayton. This is the Richardson meteorite, which is really the most famous meteorite that, that uh, fell in North Dakota because it was witnessed. People saw that fall. This is the fusion crust. Remember, I, I'm... Point that I backed up and wanted to point out the difference between the peak skill and the Drayton here on the, on the right because whenever you have a meteorite that's picked up right away, the fusion crust is going to be very black. And it's about the thickness of an eggshell. The Drayton probably sat at the surface for uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of years and literally rusted. So that's why the fusion crust, it's got a fusion crust, but that's why it's not black. So again, for recognizing meteorites, uh, they're plain looking. They are generally heavier than a, than a typical rock of, of the given size. They will attract a magnet because even the stony meteorites have enough iron in there. The, um, what you want to use, what I've found that works really well, is a refrigerator magnet, you know, one of those kind of rubbery, because if, if you use a real heavy duty magnet, just the weight of the magnet, it may not stick to it. You look for the dimpling that we talked about. And then uh, on the flat surfaces, you can see these chondrules if, if the fusion crust is missing. It, it kind of looks like tapioca pudding uh, in there, the, the round things. So here are what we call meteor wrongs, things that are not meteorites. Again, people brought them in because they look different. And again, meteorites aren't funny looking. Uh, they don't have pits. And really, the big thing is 
uh, there's no evidence of melting on them. And, and again, we get a lot of clinker and scoria from Western North Dakota that's, that's where the coal burned, baked to overlying rock. And especially if you're very close to, if that rock was just overlying the burning coal, you'll get that melted and you'll get uh, gas bubbles in there. So again, this is a porphyritic basalt. It, it's funny looking, it's, it's definitely not a meteorite. Here's an example of like a tooth or a freshwater carbonate with the pitting, again, not a, not a meteorite, the coquina uh, uh, shell uh, hash. Again, it looks different, but, it, but certainly not a meteorite. We get a fair number of these. This is from northern Minnesota. Well, this is from North Dakota, but the, the host rock is from northern Minnesota. These are banded iron, and then the glaciers brought them into North Dakota. So they will... Uh, they are attracted to a magnet, and uh, so that's why people bring them in. Well, it sticks to a magnet. It's, it's a little heavier, seems heavier than a typical rock, but it's got that layering, and that's a tip-off to us right away that it's not a meteorite. This is what I talked about before as far as... We, the other thing, so again, it, it, there's evidence of melting, and that's why people think they're a meteorite. And this, um, we get either the clinker or scoria, or we get uh, slag, thresher slag, you know, people will, will go out, this was found in the middle of the field, there's never been a homestead anywhere near, but the old threshers are out there cleaning them out, and so you get the slag that came out of, of that of burn box. So again, uh, we've, we've gone through these, and uh, most of the meteorites, as I said, were stony. There's 10% uh, are the stony iron and the iron, and we've got examples of iron meteorites that I'll show. Here's, here's a, a small chunk of one. And you generally look for, for nickel in addition to the iron. But you get what's called a Whit Whitmunchdott pattern. And that's what this looks like. That's very unique. But unfortunately, to, to etch this, to get the pattern to show up, you, you have to use hydrofluoric acid, which is very nasty. So it's not something that you want kids in a lab to, to be trying. This is a stony iron meteorite here. So now we'll just talk briefly about meteorites in North Dakota. This is a location of, of ones that we're aware of. Some of these have been confirmed, some have not. And I think right away you see there's, there's a, a conglomeration up in the northeast corner of the state. And that's for this reason. Th that's the Red River Valley. And since there's little or no rocks there. So if you've got a meteorite setting in this field, much easier to see than if you're in Dunn County in a field full of rocks. So, uh, and, and again, what's interesting about this, a fellow, this is out of Drayton, a fellow by the name of Sandy McDonald found two meteorites in the same quarter. And, and what's even more interesting though, they were two different meteorites. They were not related at all. So that, that makes you wonder if, if all of North Dakota was like the Red River Valley, we certainly would have found a lot more meteorites. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we've got in, in blue the official meteorites. They've been entered into the, the national, actually the worldwide catalog of meteorites. And then uh, three others, the, the uh, Hensel, I think, is, is since maybe is on its way to being cataloged. The Colgate, I'll just mention that just briefly, because all these things have a story. The guy was going around to different uh, old farmsteads. He was building a foundation, and, and uh, he wanted some unique rocks and, and uh, some gravel pits. And he was putting these things in, and then he decided this one was a little interesting, so he threw it aside. And then a few years later, had us look at it, and we determined that it was a meteorite. But of course, he had no idea by that time where it had actually come from. Here's the number of meteorites per state. So you can see North Dakota at 10 is on par somewhat for uh, some of the other states. Kansas, famous uh, meteorite hunter down there who, uh, so you can see not just Kansas, but I think he moved up into Nebraska and found more than, than you would anticipate given the, the land area. Richardson, I want to talk a little bit about that. As I mentioned, it's the most famous one in North Dakota. It, uh, fell in, uh, in the evening of, of uh, June of 30th, 1918. These squares represent 
witnessed accounts all the way down into South Dakota. So you had an area about 100 miles by 100 miles where people witnessed this. There was a troop train in Mandan, and, uh, and, and they witnessed it as, as it went across. So it got written up in, in many of the, the papers. But uh, what's, what's most interesting to us, and I'll go through that in a second, is that we had a geologist from the University of Minnesota who had gotten his master's degree at UND, and uh, he came running over and interviewed uh, and wrote a scientific article. So this is one that's extremely well documented. It could just as easily have been called the Mott uh, meteorite. It's halfway between Mott and Richardson. And you can see that here, we'll blow this up a little bit better. Here's the larger chunks, the smaller ones down here. Area seven miles by, by five. So at least 150 specimens were picked up with a total weight of 220 pounds. And I think, you know, I, if you remember from the pig skill picture you saw where it broke up, as these almost always do, and then the larger specimens were uh, continuing because of inertia, traveled further, and that's what we see here. So that we know that this was going up to the northeast. This is across an area, uh, we're looking to the west where some of these meteorites were picked up. Luckily, on the south end, down in here, there were fields, and so that's why there's so many of the smaller specimens picked up down here. And we've got correspondence of people wanting to sell these right away. A guy came up from Iowa and, and bought a number of these. So even back then, meteorites were highly prized, nowhere near the, the prices that they bring today. And we've got, you know, last year I was giving this talk, and, uh, or maybe it was two years ago, but but I got to this point, and the two teachers who were a little distance from each other started talking. And so, of course, as you know, as teachers, I started speeding things up. I thought, okay. But uh, they just kept getting louder. So finally, I stopped and said, you know, is there anything you want to, you got a question or something? And one of them was uh, his great uncle was one of these Steiners. So he was pretty excited about that. And he said he had, had he'd heard the family uh, history about this. Anyway, th these are some of the, the uh, comments, and uh, what I thought was, was really interesting is that, uh, you know, one, one, this fellow, Leo Kern, took shelter behind a telegraph pole because he thought it was coming right at him, but then he also could hear it, uh, he could hear it whistling by like bullets and hitting, hitting the roofs and, uh, and, and the buildings. So they were out there right away the next morning collecting what they could. And uh, that's why I say the, the, the Richardson specimens are so fresh. But all, all, you know, over time we've had scientists, uh, 67 this was written up that had come up again trying to find any, any uh, specimens. Just a quick story, a fellow from Dickinson about 10 years ago called me and uh, said, you know, I'd like you to stop when you're in the Dickinson area, stop and look at my Richardson meteorite specimen, and uh, I said, okay, I'll, I'll be happy to, but I can pretty much tell you ahead of time it's probably not, because that's how it turns out. And he said, well, his uncle had given it to him, and I said, who's your uncle? And it was uh, one of these names, Steiner or Kern or one of these, so I recognized it right away, and I said, okay, then that probably is, and stopped at his house, and I'm walking across his living room, and I can see the display cabinet he built, and I could see right away, probably from 10 feet away, that was not a meteorite. So of course, you've got to let people down kind of slowly on this. They built this and, and there was a family connection. So I, I, I said, okay, I'm, this isn't, and I'm trying to figure out how this happened. But I said, I'm sure people were picking up every black rock they could find, and this, this was a black rock. And he said that his, his uncle had pulled up, they were kids, in the back of the pickup, he had all these specimens and he let each cousin take one. And he said he chose this one because it looked different than the others. And so I said, not a good time to be different on, on, on that, unfortunately. Well, if you, if you Google uh, Richardson meteorite, you're gonna get all kinds of, of hits on this, both from museums and certainly eBay. And uh, here's, here's a small piece you can see that is, is selling for, for $700, that works out to $12,000 per pound. 
And so these things can, can, uh, can uh, be worth a lot of money. And, and so typically what happened, and the scientists were not real thrilled about it, people just cut these into little slivers and sell them that way. Makes it more difficult to, to preserve the, the science behind it. New Leipzig is another famous meteorite in North Dakota. This one, because it's an iron one, and it was picked up during the Depression. This is Daniel Buckwitz here uh, that found it holding it 44 pounds, and he sold it to the Smithsonian for $150. Well, 10 years ago, we were butting heads with the Smithsonian trying to get it up here to the Heritage Center to put on display, and I offered to buy it back for $150, with, which they weren't too thrilled about, but we did. I mean, uh, and I will thank Senator Dorgan for this. He stepped in and put some uh, pressure on the Smithsonian, and they did let us uh, display it. And this is the original up in the, in the top here. Here's some rich, Richardson meteorites, but here's the, the new Leipzig. And uh, it's still on display now, but it's a, uh, it's a model. It looks very, very good. They did a great job. You can see, even with that one, that a uh, pretty good uh, segment was cut off. So when you look at these meteorites, they're, they're uh, in many cases all over the world. Here's examples of the, uh, again, of the Richard Tennant. There's a museum in London. The uh, New Leipzig, again, is in London and Calcutta. And uh, Bosemont, which is a fairly new find, uh, is in uh, London and Germany. This is the one I like, though, that part of the Jamestown is in the Vatican. So you wonder if the Pope goes and looks at this, but I don't know. Anyway, all over, all, all over the world, and that's typical. A lot of museums will trade. They'll get a piece of something, then they'll cut it up and trade it uh, for another meteorite. These are the ones, the ones that are unconfirmed. I've, I've actually traveled and talked to people. And at Carrington, it's an interesting story because the fellow supposedly displayed it in front of, uh, of a clothing store, and then they came through and were doing some sewer work and then it was gone, so they thought that they'd rolled it into the sewer and, and buried it. So I, I, I'm not sure what happened there. But we're going to go into asteroids now, it, you know, these larger pieces that uh, can impact the Earth. And uh, it, like I say, certainly the most important one to us is the Chicxulub. So these are, are uh, mapped or known impact structures throughout the world. There's at least 150 of those. And what we know is that if you've got an impact and, and the crater that's formed is less than two miles uh, in diameter, this is the typical uh, cross-section that you get with a lot of fracturing underneath, but you get ejecta material that vaporizes and comes back out and, and forms these ejecta rims. Probably one of the most famous one, the Barringer Crater in Arizona. 50,000 years old, it's 4,000 feet deep, uh, or 4,000 foot diameter and, and 600 feet deep. The, the uh, iron meteorite that, that hit was 150 feet wide with a force of two and a half million uh, tons of TNT. And here is the ejecta cone that you get formed around that. And, uh, oops, it's gonna try to kick me out to, I shouldn't have clicked on it. Okay, this, picture is a little bit easier to see that ejecta cone sticking around. And here it is from, I was down there a year or so ago, and so here, prior to, the, to this hitting, this was all flat. So this is all the ejecta, and then the crater's right, right behind here. So you can see the, the uh, ejecta rim. Here's the crater. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so here's part of that meteorite that's on display. Now, if they're greater than two miles, what happens is that the side slopes become too unstable. And so they'll push down and you'll actually get uh, a, a um, little topographic high in the middle of the crater, as well as you'll get failure along the sides. And here's a perfect example of that on, on the moon where you can see Parts of the, the uh, rim have collapsed, but they've collapsed down in and, and it's raised up in the center. This is amazing because the, the, it has not been eroded down, so you can actually see all the ejecta that was blown out of that. Is that fairly instantaneous? Is it 
Is that fairly instantaneous, the, the bump happens? Yeah, it, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it uh, um, probably uh, within a matter of, of seconds or minutes when that happens. But just because of the energy, there's so much ener energy being dissipated. So the most famous one in North Dakota is Red Wing Creek. And uh, because it's an oil field, it was discovered in, in the 70s. Asking for 15 million to expand this facility uh, so we can try to get another 50 years out of that. We're going to have to triple the space. In uh, uh, three years ago, in 18 months, we brought in more core than we had in the previous 18 years. So that's how that's how busy we have been up there. So you've seen pictures of cuttings and and full core and. and uh, we do take a lot of pictures of the cores of boxes. In fact, we're photographing, so we've got uh, 72, 73 miles of core. And to date, we're, we're photographing everything and putting it on a subscription site. Did he run through the subscription site for you and show you how that works? Well, it's got all of the, uh, the well files, all of the material, all of the logs that have been run, the electric logs and things on, is all in that system. But then we, we photograph the, we're photographing the core. We've, we've so far photographed 110,000 feet. We've got students doing that at the University of North Dakota. We also have thin sections. I don't know if they talked about thin sections. You know, in, in medicine, they'll, they'll do a biopsy, they'll thin section, they'll look at the tissue. Well, we do the exact same thing with rock. We take a thin, very thin slice of the rock, grind it down, then we're able to look at it through a microscope, get it uh, transparent. We've got 15,000 thin sections. We took eight photographs of each, so we got 90,000 photographs there. So we've got 200,000 photographs that we've put on the website for geologists to use. 